Well, good morning. It's good to be with you guys. Uh, my name is Bill Rodriguez. I'm one of the elders here. And uh, I know that if you were here last week in the second service, Pastor Chris said something about um, if you don't see me next week um, because of a comment that he made. I just want you guys to know nothing happened to him. He's just at the retreat with 516. Um, so he's not missing or anything. Uh, so don't go, you know, searching for him or anything. We're, we're good. All right. He's in a good place. Yeah, he didn't get raptured up. You know, we're going through Revelation. Um, no, he's good. Uh, so, but I'm glad you guys are here. If uh, you're new with us or if you just, maybe today you just were running late, ran out the house without a Bible. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand real quick and one of our us will get it to you. It's not a, um, we're not trying to call you out for not having your Bible. We just want you to be able to follow along with us. Um, because if you haven't been to bow down, uh, you would, you'll know that we're very big on being able to follow uh, in your own word, right? So you have your own copy of God's word. You follow along. Don't just trust a person up here on stage with the microphone, but be able to uh, dig for yourself, look for yourself, make sure, um, you know, that what we are saying is in line with what God is saying. Amen? All right. Well, good. Well, um, we have been going through the book of Revelation, uh, if you haven't been here in the past couple of weeks, but uh, we're steadily marching through. Um, here at Bow Down, we, we go through a book of the Bible, and sometimes it can seem pretty lengthy, depending on the book. Um, it was interesting that I think four chapters of Ruth took us a, a couple months. Um, but hey, sometimes we just go in deeper a little bit, and we want to make sure that we're handling God's Word correctly, and that we're you know giving you what we feel like God's put, put on our hearts to say. Um, so that's why. So Revelation, I don't know about you, but growing up for me, Revelation was one of those books that like um, pastor rarely ever preached about. And usually when he did, um, it was a kind of just a really quick kind of run through Revelation because there was always this like fear of Revelation that um, the, the book and, and what happens in Revelation is like people don't really want to preach that message. That doesn't always sound good on a on a, a Sunday morning. Uh, well, we're going to be diving into Revelation 8. We've been going through the, the seven seals. We're going to open up uh, and, and figure out what that seven seal is today. And as you're reading through this, I just want you to know and understand that um, with Revelation, right, if you're one of those people that really wants like a solid, specific answer, you might not walk out with that today. All right? You might not walk out with this very specific and that's what's made it a little bit difficult for me as I've been studying through Revelation because there's different views, right? There's a lot of different views on Revelation. And you can get really, really out there if you really search for it, but, you know, Revelation is a lot of symbols, right? And so we are kind of left interpreting those and we use Scripture to try to help determine and, and help us interpret those things. But not every time are you going to get that definitive answer. But I do believe as we go through it and as we search and as we learn and as we read that there is an overall message that God wants to put on our hearts even through that. So I hope that as we, we go through that, you can, you know, kind of be there with me. So I want to read this quote to you um, that I got uh, as I was <clears throat> reading and reading some commentaries. And it says this. It says, the book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible because a working knowledge of the 65 books preceding it is the basic requirement for an understanding of its vivid language. I get a little irritated when I see new, a new Christian immediately start teaching a class in the book of Revelation. Why doesn't he go back to the beginning or start with Genesis? Take some other book. But do not begin with Revelation. I come to this teaching of Revelation only after taking nearly five years to go through the rest of Scripture. I believe that gives us the right to teach the book of Revelation. I would not want it otherwise. It was Peter who said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. That's from 2 Peter 1.20. You do not interpret Revelation by itself. There are 65 books before it. The symbols are going to be given to us, but we need to remember that the symbols stand for awful realities. And so that kind of really helped put it in perspective. So today I'm not one that's going to come to you as this scholar of Revelation. I haven't studied Revelation for the last 15 years and I have books and all this. I, I come studying Revelation wanting to know more, right, and continuing to read and continuing to look and to continuing to see how other people view it. But there's a lot of symbolism in here, right? 
But hopefully as we walk through it, some of that symbolism we see in other books of the Bible. So I also don't want you to hear today, well, I, have, I don't know the rest of the Bible, so I guess I can't know Revelation today, so I guess I'm going to take a hike or I'm going to check out. No, no, don't do that, right? There's still stuff to learn, but what, basically what he was saying is that like, the Bible is a complete work for a reason, right? And as you read the Bible, you see how God interweaves himself through all of it and how things that were said hundreds of years before now start to come to pass, right? Because that's who God is. He lays it all out there for us, right? None of this is a surprise uh, to him. So with that being said, we're going to dive in Revelation chapter 8. Um, so if you'll turn uh, with me for that, Revelation chapter 8. Uh, verse 1 says this. It says, when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew the trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning, on, burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew the trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the, the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light may be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining. And likewise, uh, sorry, and likewise a third of the night. <clears throat> then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. All right, let's pray. Father, as we get into your word, as we read your word, God, as we try to better understand your word, God, I just pray that you would speak into our hearts, God. Allow us to hear your word, to see your truth um, and warning about what's to come, God, and then to know how to move and how to react as your followers. Father God, uh, just speak to us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So that passage right there, right, uh, you read through that and you're like, wow, like that's that's a lot, right? That's a lot coming, coming down that we hear. Um, how do we unpack this? And then what does that mean for me as a believer? Um, I think sometimes with Revelation, we read it and it's just like this doomsday mentality, right? And it's just like depressing. Oh, look at all the things that are going to come, all these, this disaster and everything. And we have that kind of mentality. But I believe, just like we've been reading through Revelation, and Jesus said to come up with me, right? He, he told John, come up with me so you can see what's about to happen. That's what God is calling us to. He wants us to see what's about to happen. He wants us to know what's coming. And then he wants to, to, to activate us into his ministry and, and what it means for us today. All right. So um, in verse 1, it says the lamb opened the seventh seal. The lamb is Jesus. Um, and we see that. Uh, if we go back to Revelation six or Revelation five, six and seven, it talks about um, the lamb standing and he was the one that was given the seal. So it's Jesus that's the one that could open the seals and he is the one that's standing there um, uh, holding the seals. And so the lamb in this reference is Jesus. And then it says there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, these are one of these the examples of a, of a thing like. I don't know why my mind went to it, but it's like, I want to know why it was about half an hour. Like, why was it that specific amount of time? Why wasn't it an hour? Why wasn't it a day? Why wasn't it a year? 
Well, I don't have an answer for you. Um, and, and neither did a lot of people, right? There was no, like, it was this specific amount of time. All we know is that John is trying to best describe not only what he sees, but what he experiences. And for about a half an hour, there was silence in heaven. Now, why is that a big deal, that there was silence in heaven? Because throughout Revelation and even other passages within Scripture, it talks about how praise is constantly going up to our Lord, right? That his throne room is filled with praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, right? That's what we hear. But for, th- for about half an hour, there was silence. There was no praise. There was no, nothing going up. And why is that? Because we've already gone through six seals and this is the seventh, right? We went through the first six quickly. There was a small break in chapter seven. And then the seventh seal. It's kind of like if you've ever been in a bad storm, like there's like this calmness before a storm hits. If you've ever been through a hurricane, right, the eye of the hurricane, everything gets really, really calm. And if you didn't have all the technology to know how hurricanes work, you would think that the storm was over in the eye of a hurricane and you would come out and you wouldn't think a big deal of it. It's, It's just calm. It clears up. And then what happens? The second part of the hurricane comes and it intensifies, right? And so there's this silence in heaven because of the judgment that's about to come. Praise, worship, fill the heavens, but now that judgment looms, there's a silence. The steps of God from mercy to judgment are always slow, they're reluctant, and they're measured. We all understand that God could, could bring judgment in one seal, right? He didn't even have to have any seals. He didn't even have to wait till revelation. He could have brought judgment at any time, at any place. But God deals with us, right, in his own timing. And so that's what God continued to remind me in this half an hour time frame. It's like, you know what? God deals with things in his own timing. He does things that he wants to do in his own timing, and I have to trust and believe in that. And the same with his judgment. He could pour out his judgment all at once. But he continues to measure it out little by little. Why? Because his heart is for people to repent and come back to him. Ezekiel uh, 18, verses 30 through 32, it says this. It says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. We have to be very careful as believers to look at Revelation as this judgment for these heathen, pagan God rejecting people, and this is exactly what they deserve. We have to be careful walking in that because God's heart, right? We just read it right here. He says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. God wants to see people repent and come to him. So it's kind of like that, that silence it's kind of before judgment. It's kind of like if you were, when you were a kid, um, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one, but I'd get in trouble and my mom would be like, go to your room, right? I'd rather be punished right there. I'd rather be spanked. I'd rather say you're grounded, whatever. But it's like, go to your room. And then you sit in your room for however long you never know because parents are just good at like making you wait, right? You're just sitting in your room just like, what's going to happen? Am I going to get grounded? Am I going to get this taken away, right? And there's like this silence before they come up and deal out the punishment, right? Um, That's kind of what... This entails like there's this this silence and understanding silence can, you know, can be a little bit uncomfortable. So I have 28 minutes left here. If I just stopped talking right now. And just decided to stare at you guys for the rest of that time. (laughs) I love you, Nick. (laughs) It would be kind of awkward, right? 30 minutes in heaven could seem like an eternity when there's praise constantly be thrown up to him. 
Now, I need all 28 of those minutes to get through this passage, so I'm not going to give that silence, but that's kind of the, the image that they're giving. And then in verse 2, it talks about um, the seven angels, all right, the seven angels come on the scene. And there's, there's thoughts about who those seven angels are. I'm not going to really get into that because I, I don't feel like that's necessarily the importance of what, where we want to go with that. But understanding that angels throughout Scripture bring a message and they bring a warning. Okay, When angels come on the scene, they bring a message and they bring a warning. So in Luke 1, chapter 19, it says, And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. Right? So we see an angel bringing a message of good news. Right? Then in Genesis 19, this is a chapter about Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot. And so Jesus, or God sends angels down to earth to warn them. Uh, we'll pick it up in verse 12. It says this. It says, Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, son-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against his people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So one passage, we have a, a message of good news, and the next passage, we have a message of warning that destruction is about to come. And I think we can understand these seven angels are not here any longer to bring this message of good news and peace. They're, they're coming to bring a warning that that judgment is now coming. And so then we step into the seven, the seven trumpets, all right? And so a trumpet is used uh, throughout Scripture, one, to assemble God's people. And, and even throughout the book of, of Exodus, it shows how different trumpets uh, sounds longer, shorter were used to assemble people in different ways. So in one, it was used to assemble God's people, and the other, it was used to call as a call to war. And we even see that in, in our military, you know, going back to like civil war or stuff, using that trumpet to, to blow the trumpet, different, you know, different trumpet calls meaning different things. These trumpets are about to be unleashed, and, and it's a call to war. Um, it also reminded me, you know, where as we continue to walk through Revelations, you see this symbolism of seven, right? And many people say seven is the number of completion, right? So we had seven seals. We now have seven trumpets, all right? Six seals, and then on the seventh seal, bam, we got seven trumpets. When you get to the seventh trumpet, which I'm not going to cover today, seven bold judgments, right? Seven, seven, seven. You have seven angels, seven days in creation. And one story that, that immediately came to mind as I was reading through this was in Joshua when he fought the battle of Jericho, all right? That's Joshua 6, and I'll, I'll read it. It's verses 3 through 5. It says, You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. The symbolism of seven, right? We see it, and it's bringing judgment, right? So then in, in verse 3, it talks about a, another angel. Um, as I was reading, some, you know, there's, there was some that tried to argue that maybe this other angel was, was Jesus. But we see Jesus as the lamb, the one holding the seal. So I don't <clears throat> personally believe that that is Jesus. I, I, and, and Revelation 5 also alludes to that um, because he's the one that's opening the seal. Um, but then it talks, it goes into verse 4 about the incense and prayer. And I want to read that again. It says, And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And so understanding this, it all starts at the altar, Right? We had the silence, 
right? Because judgment was coming. And before judgment is handed out, what do we do? We come, they come to the altar. And the prayers and the incense, right, are, are, are lifted up to God. Because our prayers are incense to God. It's a sweet aroma. When we lay, our, you know, lay before God and we cry out to him, he hears our prayers. Prayers are worship to God. It's pleasing. It's a sweet aroma. He hears our prayers and he hears our cries, and it's understanding that he, he answered those in his own timing. Have you ever prayed for something and not gotten an answer? Right? And maybe you're still waiting for that answer to come. Or maybe it just took a long period of time before God answered it. God is always working in his own timing. And I know that's hard for us as humans who want to control so many things to understand that God works outside of our time and constraints, right? But some, there were some people in the Bible that continued to pray for things, and their life ended before they saw that answer. Are we willing to continue to, to dive into prayer and continue to pray for things, knowing that that prayer might never be answered until this life is over for me? These prayers were, answered, were offered to God, and Specifically, I want to go back to Revelation 6.10. And it says, They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? This was the prayer of God's people that they had continued to lift up to God. How long is it going to be before you come back and you avenge us? And these are the prayers that, that are being offered up as a sweet fragrance to God. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17, it says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us proceeds, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Our life, our prayers, how we conduct ourselves is a fragrance to God, and it's a fragrance to the people around us. When you've been in the presence of God, people can feel that. When Moses came off the mountain, right, his presence was so radiant they had to put something over his face because he was shining so brightly because he had been in the presence of God. That's what our life should be. We should, everywhere we go, any situation that we're in, that's what our life should represent, that we are a fragrance to the people around us, right? to believers and to unbelievers. When you come into a room, you, your fragrance, your aroma should encourage a fellow brother and sister in Christ to continue on. And as you go into environments of people who are not believers, that fragrance should be intriguing to them. Like, what is that, right? Kind of like when somebody's wearing a, a fragrance or a perfume, you kind of smell it, you're like, oh, what is that? Sometimes it smells good, sometimes it doesn't smell good. Right? You should be a sweet aroma because your life is sold out to Christ. Psalm 141, 1 and 2 says this. It says, O Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. This is what God is calling us to in a time of judgment, in a time when all these things are falling around, that God is calling us to be that incense, that fragrance. And so very quickly, the angel's censer goes from being filled with incense and prayer to being filled with fire. Fire many times is used for purification. If you know anything about heating up metals, you heat up metals to their hottest point so that all the impurities rise to the top. 
And then you continue to wipe off the impurities, right, as they're drawn out. And the, the way that the, the metalsmith will know that the metal is now pure is they will see their reflection in that metal, right? Such a beautiful, right, picture of how God looks at us. He heats the fire up in our lives, right, because he's got to draw stuff out. If I have problems with anger, right, God can't make life easy for me all the time because that anger is never going to be drawn up and I'm never going to have to deal with it. I've got to be put in situations that are going to make me angry. And that's tough. But that's the only way to draw out those impurities. If I want to be a better husband, it doesn't mean that my, my marriage is going to be perfect all the time. It means that struggles and, and arguments and stuff are going to come up because those are the things that are going to come up that, that need to be worked on. Right? Fire was used for purification. It says in Scripture that branches that don't bear fruit, they're what? Thrown into the fire. This fire that's being thrown down onto the earth is judgment beginning and it's a purification of the earth so one of the commentaries I use was a a kind of old school guy his name is J. Vernon McGee Um, and he made this quote and I just thought it was it was perfect to to say before we go into these uh, trumpets and and some of the symbolism he said this it says the symbols that are used are symbols of the reality which is coming plain language could not make it clear to our mind how terrible and tragic the, tribula- the great tribulation will be. It begs description, and so God exhausts language and brings in symbols. So don't get caught up in the symbol, right? Just know and understand John is doing his best to describe things he's never seen before. Language could not hold, right, the images of what's to come, so symbols were used. So I just thought that was great as we enter into these um, trumpet judgment. So the first trumpet, and it says this, it says the first angel blew the trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. Now this is another one of those examples. It's like why one third? Why not half? Why not a fifth, right? But it's a third. There's many different ideas about that. There's three people in the, the Trinity. There's, there's, there's ways that you can go with that. I don't have a definitive, but it's one third. But why was all the green grass burned up? I don't know. One day we can ask God why he, he, he dealt it out this way. But it does show you that God's judgment comes in increments, right? He could have wiped out 100%, but he only wiped out a third, all right? Also understand that the first thing that he wipes out is plant life. Now, if you go back to Genesis and you go through creation, now it wasn't day one, but the first living thing that that God created was was plants. And that's the first thing that he's wiping out. You see how intricate God's word is? Man, if we could only understand how many things connect and are interwoven throughout Scripture. It is the most beautiful book that's ever been written. It's amazing. And you can continue, people can continue to try to discount God's word, but they'll always come up short. And then many times they come up believing the exact opposite of what they went in to try to prove. A lot of people also relate the trumpets to the plagues in Exodus, right, that, that were dealt out um, to Pharaoh and his people. And you can see some of the connections that could be there. In Exodus 19, the, the Israelites had just been freed from slavery, and God is, is speaking to them. So Moses is going up on the mountain. He's told the people to come around the mountain, but he's giving them boundaries not to cross because his presence is coming down. And so Exodus 19, 16, he says this, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. So fire has been thrown down, lightning, thunder, earthquakes, and then the first trumpet blows. You think people on the earth are trembling at what's, what's about to come? They have no idea. But what do we do as humans? We try to reason. Oh, it must be this. It must be that. Oh, it must be 
a scientific answer. And as these trumpets continue to be blown and things keep coming, people on earth are going to realize there is no explanation for these things but God. And that's the way that God deals it out because he wants them to know the only explanation for all of this is me. In Exodus 30, 38, <clears throat> starting in uh, verse 17, just another way how Scripture written way before connects to what we're going through in Revelation. It says this, but on that day, the day that God will come against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, my wrath will be aroused in my anger. For in my jealousy and my blazing wrath, I declare, on that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish in the sea and the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field and all creeping things will creep on the ground. And all the people who are on the face of the earth shall quake at my presence. And the mountain shall be thrown down and the cliffs shall fall. And every wall shall tumble to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. With pestilence and bloodshed, I will enter into judgment with him. And I will reign upon him and his hordes and many people who are with him, torrential rains and hailstones, fire and sulfur. So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. They will know that I am the Lord. They will know who it is that is bringing about uh, this judgment. So then we get to the second trumpet. And the second trumpet, the angel blew, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, again, John is trying to best describe what he sees. Some people believe that this great mountain on fire is a volcano. And so if you go with that theory, a volcano, a huge volcano that erupts into the sea, you could see how it could kill animals, right? It could take out ships by creating, you know, a tsunami or whatever. You could see that. But I believe in, in this passage because John is trying to describe it. He says something like a great mountain. There's, there's another theory that connects all of the trumpets together that, that believes that this is um, talking about a giant meteor. And so <clears throat> this is where it kind of gets on, on the weird side. You know, you start to think, oh, this sounds like a movie. It sounds like science fiction. Well, actually, they did make a movie about it. It was called Armageddon, all right? And if you're younger than me, you might not know that movie. If you're about my age, you, you know that movie, Bruce Willis, right? And so the basic premise of this movie is that you know, somebody looking through a telescope saw that this giant meteor, right, was headed towards Earth. And something needed to be done about it. And so they round, out, round up, try to figure out how are we going to combat this problem. So they team up with NASA and they get some astronauts and they come up with this idea. The only way that we're going to be able to stop it is by flying up to the meteor, landing on it drilling into it, putting bombs in it, and blowing it up before it hits the earth, right? And so they, it's, it's, I'm not going to say I recommend it. I don't know that it's family friendly. I think it's rated R. But anyway, <laughs> that was their plan. They go up there, and, you know, obviously Hollywood, they, 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 you know, get as much out of it as they can. But anyway, it's successful. They go up there. They land on this meteor. They blow it up. You know, it doesn't hit earth. Everybody's safe. Um, so at first, it's like, Oh, that sounds like a movie I've seen. But understanding, he's saying like a great mountain, burning with fire, that would be that. All right? And a lot of people believe that there will be something like that, and we'll get into that in the third trumpet. But the impact that it would make would be, they say, that of 100 atomic bombs if something like that hit the earth. And so you could see how that could create, you know, where it says... A third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures died, a third of the ships were destroyed. Some believe that the, the blood is a representation of what's called red tide, which if you live in Florida, you've seen that, the algae that comes in and kind of takes over, and it can actually turn the, the water different color and be hazardous and, and pollute the water. So understand, these four trumpets are all things that are, um, have an impact on our 
uh, ecosystem, okay? The third trumpet, and it says, The angel blew the third trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Now, it's interesting, star, you know, translated. Many believe that's going to be an asteroid, right? So I had to look up the difference between an asteroid and a meteor. So asteroid is huge, right? Meteors are what break off of an asteroid, all right? So if you might have already known that. I didn't know that, so I had to look it up. Um, wormwood. Wormwood in, throughout Scripture is a bitter root. And when it got into anything, it could be poisonous. So if you were to drink that. So some take it back to that. Um, but that bitterness is always brought up with God's judgment because God's judgment is always bitter. It's never, it never tastes good. And it reminded me of when we went through the book of Ruth, Naomi, right? She came back to her homeland and she said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara because, because God dealt bitterly with me, right? Now, there's something called the Wormwood Prophecy. And um, Pastor Chris sent me a video, so I watched it this week. Um, about that. And so in 2004, scientists discovered that there is this huge asteroid out in space headed towards us, and they've predicted that it will interact with Earth April 13th, which happens to be a Friday, 2029. All right? So I'm watching this, this prophecy, right? and trying to better understand it and how it fits into what we're reading about. And whether you believe it or not, I'm not going to come up here on stage and say that I can say for certain that April 13th, 2029, that this asteroid is going to hit the earth and all of these things are going to start to play out. I can't tell you that. But as I'm listening to this and, and praying through it and trying to see, like, how does this actually relate to my life? It was like, wow, 2029. Like when I was a kid, that seemed like forever. It seemed like I'd never make it to 2029. But now we're seven years away from 2029. And so then I started thinking, wow, that's seven years. I have two kids at my house that are 14. One is 12. Seven years. That's 21 and 19. So if you're telling me I have seven more years with my kids, that they're not going to live out of their 20s, right? It started making me think, how would I live this life differently? What are things that I would do if I knew there was a, a, a ticking clock and I knew that end date? All of a sudden, saving money for a rainy day becomes we're going to go do things and experience things because life is short and it's going to be over soon. Now what I do this afternoon and what I do tomorrow and what I do next month means a whole lot different than if I'm just looking at time as just this never-ending thing and I've got 40, 60, 80 more years, whatever it could be. So it started making me think, man, what is my responsibility to, to my wife, to my kids? What would that seven years look like if I had a ticking clock? And sometimes we, we forget that, that life is a, a ticking clock. That we always think that we're going to have more time than we do. Time is a commodity we can never get back. And how would I live my life differently? So this wormwood is going to come and it's going to hit the earth. And it's going to pollute the water supply. Now understand if you go with the giant asteroid that, you know, meteors and all of that, what it's going to do to our ecosystem, that a lot of it could line up with, with what it's talking about here. So the fourth trumpet, a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise, a third of the night. So if that hits, the effects of everything that it's going to bring, right, how it's going to change our climate, how it's going to change a lot of things. All of that stuff could line up. Now, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm, I'm still studying. There's still a lot of different theories. If you start studying Revelation and all the theories, there's a lot right here, and then there's a wide stretch on both sides of where it can go and what people believe 
about revelations. And so I don't necessarily want to get so caught up on those things where it's like I have to find the answer as to be able to dig out what is it that God wants me to know from this. He wants me to know that judgment is coming. He wants me to know that this is what's going to happen and that my life is important today. For me, I'm sealed in Christ. I gave my life to Christ. I came to a point in my life where I recognized I needed a Savior, that I couldn't do it on my own, that I had sin in my life. And the only way that I would be reconnected with the God of this world was through Jesus Christ. And I gave my life to him, and I gave over control of my life, and I gave it up to him. And now I try to follow him as best as I can every single day. So I know that I'm sealed in Christ because his word tells me that. So I'm good. Whether you believe that we'll be raptured before all this happens or in the middle, it doesn't matter. If an asteroid falls on my house, I know where I spend an eternity. But there are people that we come in contact with every single day that don't have that hope, that don't have that future, that don't know Jesus. And so we as believers have to not look at this as, woe is me, right? As soon as I thought about my kids, it was all inward focus. What would I do for my family? What would I do for my kids? How would I spend my money on us to make the best out of this life before it's over? When it should have been, my family is good. They know Jesus. But how can I be reaching out to other people that don't know before this judgment comes? Because after this judgment, they don't have another shot at it. And I come in contact with people every single day that are far from Jesus. Understand, believers, God is giving us the opportunity to come up and to see what's going to happen so then we can react on it. Not that I can go buy land and build a fallout bunker and stock it up with food and just lock my family in there and just be safe until this world ends. That's not what he's calling us to. And then verse 13, he says this. He says, then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. At the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So you think the first four were bad? Woe to anybody who's left on earth when the next three come. Woe, woe, woe. Three times for the three trumpets that are about to sound. The first four, right, all had to do with our ecosystem. The next three are not. And understand, throughout this process, God continues to pour out his judgment in sections because his heart is still that people would repent and come back to him. The first four trumpets also reveal the mercy of God's judgment. These are partial judgments striking only one-third and are meant to warn and lead a rebellious world to repentance before the final curtain. For now, God spares more than he smites. He could have destroyed it all in one, but he has grace. He could have taken my life many times, but he had grace. There are people in the Bible that did less and were put to death immediately than I've done, and yet God spares me and has grace on my life. Why? Because he's preparing us for what's coming. And this is the message that as I was praying, God continued to put in my heart over and over again, is how are we preparing now that we know what's coming? Hurricane season is coming up. I know that because my wife, she is deathly afraid of hurricanes. If you ever need to know what is going on in the hurricane realm, she knows because she keeps up with that stuff. We will never go on a cruise during the summer because it's hurricane season. And she will never, ever, ever put herself in the water on a big boat if a hurricane might have any possible chance of coming near us. All right. When hurricanes come. Right? You're in two camps. You're in one is, I'll never hit us. I don't have to prepare. Or you're in the other camp of, I'm going to make sure I'm ready. Right? And a lot of times, the, ah, it's not going to hit us, it does, and then you end up not ready. Right? Prepared. They have a prepared list that you can, that you can see online that has everything that you should get in preparation for a hurricane. Right? If you don't prepare, who's that on? That's on you, right? That's your choice, 
All right. As believers, I don't know. I don't believe that we have a choice. God has told us what's coming and now he is giving us a charge, a calling. Like Pastor Chris was talking about on that video, we have a calling, right? There's a specific calling, but there's a, a general calling as well. And in this time when things are happening, right, we know what's coming. God is calling us believers to rise up because he has shown us. He has taken us up to see the view of what's about to happen so that then he can mobilize us to do what he's calling us. So I believe in this passage, if you walk out of here like, I really wish I knew this or this or this, well, you can do research on your own and, and look at the different views about that and see. But what more what I hope is this. What should our posture be now that we know this? What should our posture be? We should get our horse ready for battle. If you try to go to the stores once the hurricane is hitting or you try to leave because we tried that one time to get out of here when the hurricane was coming 95 was a parking lot it's too late then you got to get your horse ready for battle now as a farmer you don't wait for the rain to then go out and in the rain and prepare your field no you prepare your field ahead of time for the rain to come and when the rain comes right it helps the crops when I was a football player at Liberty, we, every week before the next game, we got this huge packet. And it was a scouting report of every single player on the other team. So I could go to that scouting report, and I knew exactly who I was going to be playing against. I knew their name. I knew their height. I knew their weight. I knew what they liked, what they didn't like. I knew everything about this person. I was prepared. Right, what they're weak at as far as um, their skills on the field, what they were strong at, right? Tendencies, which means on certain plays they do certain things that I need to look for. Because our coach wanted us to be prepared when the game hit. And God wants us to be prepared for what's to come. So how are we preparing for that? Do we tend to be inward focused? Right? Okay, now that I know that these things are coming, am I going to focus on myself or am I going to die to myself to serve the king? And it all starts with prayer. The lamb came, there was silence in heaven, then the angels came and what? They presented a sacrifice at the altar, incense and prayers. That's how they started before these judgments were released. And that's where we need to start believers today, is at the altar. It starts with prayer. It starts with us being on our knees before God and asking God, God, what is it that you're calling me to in this time? What is it that I need to do? How is it that not only do I need to prepare, but how do I need to help others prepare for what's coming? And for some of you today, it might be, you know what, God, I'm not living my life the way that I should be. So before I can help anybody else or prepare, I've got to get some things right in my own life. God, you've been, you know, drawing out some things in my own life that I've got to deal with before I can dive into what you're calling me to do. Are we living out our faith in such a way that it's like an incense to, to God, a pleasing aroma? Is God, right, right? through our lives being offered up a sweet-smelling aroma? Or does it stink? It all starts at the altar. So I want to read you this quote uh, from Matthew Henry. And it says this, it says, <clears throat> Times of danger should be praying times, and so should times of great expectation. Both our fears and our hopes should put us upon prayer. And where the interest of the church of God is deeply concerned, the hearts of the people of God in prayer should be greatly enlarged. We will never be able to see change outside of this building if the change isn't in us. It starts with us. How we move reflects our time in prayer with God, our communion with God. We must stay in tune with the Spirit, just like Jesus did. 
Jesus said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. Well, how do we know what the Father is telling us to do? Well, you got to spend time with him. And it starts at the altar on your knees in prayer before a holy and righteous God who is about to unleash judgment on a world that is lost and dying. We cannot look at it as believers and just say they're getting what they deserve because, hey, I'm not getting what I deserve. Believers, God is calling us in this time now that we know what's going to come to reach out to those around us to share the hope that somebody shared with us because woe to the people that are left on the earth when these final three are unleashed. So worship team, if you guys will will come up. I don't know where it is that, that... That God is hitting you today. Um, Like I said at the beginning, I don't come as one that that claims to be a scholar of of revelation. But what I try to do is give you what God says, but then also help you to, to move in that. Because sometimes I feel like we miss the application piece. We we gain knowledge. Okay, I know that these things are gonna happen in this way. But what does that mean for you today? What does that mean today when you go to lunch, right? And you're tired and you've had a long weekend and you're not looking forward to tomorrow and you just want to go and eat and you don't want to talk to your waitress. You don't want to talk to the people at the table next to you. You just want to eat and be left alone and then be able to go home and put on your pajamas and chill out and watch TV, whatever, right? And I say that because I feel that sometimes, right? Today when I go, I've talked for over two hours this morning. In two services. I just want to sit and eat and be by myself. But what is God calling me to? Is that person that's serving me not important enough for me to have a small conversation? Is the aroma of my life and how my family lives, right, drawing other people into that? I'm not asking you to go on the street corner and preach to thousands. I'm just asking that God might be calling you to reach out to your neighbor or your coworker or somebody you come in contact with today and share the hope in Jesus because you know what's coming. I would never send my kids to run into the uh, busy highway, right? Because I know what could happen. Now that we know what's coming, I pray that it will give us a a greater love for the people around us that don't know Jesus. Let's pray. Father, whatever it is that you're calling us to right now in this moment, in this time, I pray that we'll be obedient. Maybe it's coming down and kneeling at this altar right here and just praying. Maybe there's some things in our life that we've got to get right, God, and we just need to lay them at your feet, God. Maybe it's coming up and getting prayer because you're struggling or you just need help with, with knowing what direction to go. Or maybe you just want to be encouraged in what you're already doing, God. God, maybe it's coming over here and taking communion. And just being reminded of the body that was beaten and the blood that was shed for our life. And using that to help spur us on today, this week, this month for you. Whatever it is that you're calling us to, God, I just pray that we would be obedient in it. Now that we know what's coming, God, we have a responsibility. May we walk in that today, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.